are recording this now that I remember to stop the pause and apologies about that. But I'm going to hand over to you, Mark. And before, as I say, there's more people logging on and logging on. Um, so before we get into the actual demonstration, tell me how you got into mathematics um, and your love for it. So I got into mathematics in a slightly funny way. Um, my original love was art, visual art, drawing pictures. And I was really interested in shapes, different kinds of shapes, uh, um, you know, how you can maybe represent shapes with nice pictures and so on. And I found that when I was studying in school, I wasn't, I wasn't particularly great at maths in secondary school, but I used to paint a lot and I got interested in geometry. And uh, from there, when I was in college, I did a degree in science and I was interested in lots of things, biology, chemistry and so on. Um, but I found I was a bit of a daydreamer when I was in the labs. Uh, and I found that probably the best subject for me was maths because I could kind of daydream, use my imagination. And I didn't have to worry about burning the laboratory down because I forgot to turn off my experiment. So um, maths, I think, is a great subject for people who like to daydream and, like, and have nice imaginations. That's brilliant, Mark. And I was saying to you before we joined, um, myself and Mark were doing a wee quick run through to make sure our vices were working and we were all set up for this. And I was saying to Mark that I did engineering and you know, when you think of science week and people think of science, they naturally think of, you know, someone working in a lab with a white coat, but that isn't all science is about. Mathematicians, and I think, I know for to be an engineer, Mark, and most science, you need to, you know, maths is the, the, the form and foundation or the basic principles involved in all science. And, you know, it's, it's fascinating that uh, I know when I was doing my maths on how much maths comes into our everyday life. Um, so it's, it's brilliant that um, we're joined with so many. And I have to shout out, people are using the couple questions and answers here. So I have to say hello to third and fourth class in Cross Keys. Corliss National School, County Cavan, Leitrim National School, Galway, and Muckalee, Kilkenny, and Dunboyne. Hello, Ms. Wall um, from Dunboyne Senior Primary School. You can use the question and answer function. Um, and if anyone has joined us late, you're very, very welcome. Or sorry, not late. Um, we're only four minutes past 10. Very welcome. We're so excited. Hi, everyone in fifth class in school on Clucker in Kilbegan. Apologies if I've uh, pronounced that incorrectly. We're delighted to have you here. Um, so we're going to start off. This is being recorded, but please rest assured. Hello, Miss Conlon from St Mary's in Talla. No faces will be um, shown throughout this. I will send all the teachers, anyone who has registered the link. Once you get the link of the recording, please feel free to share it with your colleagues. Um, and hopefully you'll find... Um, You'll hope, hopefully you'll find benefit this, this session beneficial. As I say, we're delighted in Maynooth University to be joined with so many. Um, so I'm going to hand over to you after I call out um, fifth and sixth class in Neve Lurgan in Kildare, Gail Skull Lurgan, Hi Ranga Three, Agus Ranga Kahar, New Market National School. Um, we also have Cross Patrick National School, Kilgenny. Hi to the people up in Dundalk, uh, De La Salle, fourth class, uh, Rathmore um, in Carlo, and I'll get to more later on. So, Mark, I'm going to hand over to you. I'm your assistant for out, throughout this. So, any technical difficulties, um, I'll run off and get someone for you because I probably I'll probably break the internet. So, welcome everyone. I'm going to hand over to Mark, but I'm here in the background. Mark, shout if you need me. No problem. Thank you. Um, so. Uh... I, I was going to ask, am I audible? But I suppose people can't really respond. So I'm hoping at least Lisa will tell me if I'm audible and visible and all of that. Um, so there are essentially two parts to this. Um, I'm going to give a very small and short slideshow. And the point of the slideshow is just to explain a couple of concepts, a couple of mathematical concepts to you um, that have to do with, of course, my favorite part of mathematics, which is geometry, and in particular, the study of different kinds of shapes. And uh, there will be one sum. I know the last thing you want to do is sums right now. There'll be one very short sum in it. And I promise we'll get it over with early and the rest will be just nice pictures. Um, just to begin with, I, I mean, when I was asked the question of why I get into maths and I, and I said it was because I love painting, I love geometry, I love shapes. And of course, as a child, when I was in primary school, I remember the teacher bringing in what she called the box of shapes. And she had all sorts of nice shapes in there. There was, you know, there was a cube, there was a, a pyramid and so on. And I found this fascinating. And so I'm going to start by sharing with you my five favorite shapes, which I have here in front of me to share. And then um, I'm going to do a little slideshow, which shouldn't take more than about 10 minutes. 
And then we're going to get to the main event, which will be finding the kinds of shapes we can make using soap films. OK, so essentially using soapy water. And I have a big uh, tub of soapy water here, which I'll show you in a few minutes. So my five favorite shapes are the following. So I'm going to show you this one first, which it's maybe a little bit hard to see. So I'll turn it around a bit. Is this is the picture visible here? Um, Am I, I'm in the wrong, the wrong camera. Yeah, you're in the wrong camera. That one's ah, the wrong camera. camera. I have two cameras. I'm very sophisticated. I have two cameras. So this shape here looks a little bit like a triangle, but I'm turning it around in various ways. This is what's known as a tetrahedron. And tetra is a Greek word for four, and it has four triangles put together to make it. So I hope, Ita, you can tell me if this is reasonably visible. This is my, my tetrahedron. I'll go a little bit closer. Um, the second is a familiar one. This is, of course, a cube. Hopefully you can all see the cube here. Um, again, Ita, you're my, you're my uh, controller here. You I'm your eyes. I, I the problem with two yeah. cameras is sometimes you can be sort of uh, unaware of which camera you're in. So this is my cube. The third shape, this is another funny name. This is made up of eight triangles put together. And this is called an octahedron. So octa for eight. So eight triangles. Uh, and you're going to be seeing these shapes again. So that's why I'm introducing them now. Okay. The fourth shape, which I really love. This is probably my favorite of the five, okay? And this, uh, hang on, am I on the right camera? Uh, hold on a minute. Yeah, that's good. Where you are there, Mark, yep. This is good, yeah? Yep. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go and get it in both. Um, this thing here is made of pentagons. Remember, a pentagon is a five shape. You can see the front face is a pentagon. And there are 12 pentagons glued together to make this shape. And this is known as the dodecahedron, okay? This is a dodecahedron. And the last of my favorite shapes is Mark, made up of 20 triangles. Mark, just you're in the corner there, so maybe move over. I'm, I'm in the corner. Is yeah. this better? That's better. Yeah, that's hang on. better. I'll, show you, I'll show you the dodecahedron again. Yeah, that's These great. are the technical glitches we have to get through at the beginning. I'm sorry, everyone. Um, so this is the dodecahedron here, made up of pentagons. Okay, 12 pentagons glued together. And then finally, the fifth of the five shapes I love. This is called the icosahedron. And this is maybe a little bit difficult to see. Hopefully you can see it. It's made up of 20 uh, triangles glued together. And what's interesting about all of these shapes are they're all solid shapes and they're made from gluing simple pieces, squares, triangles, or pentagons. And at every single point, the shape looks the same. It's the same number of faces uh, meeting. And apparently there are only five ways of doing this. And these are the five. The only ways you can make solid shapes where they look the same at every point. So those are known as the platonic solids. And we'll be seeing them again in a little bit. So what I'm going to do now is share the screen with you, and I hope this works. I'll do my best to make it work. Um, so I have to be, can you, uh, Issa, can you switch me to hosting from the laptop? Okay. Oh, sorry. Nick. Host. So. You're now host, Mark. Okay, so now let me share the screen. Um, here we go. Yep. Is this coming up? Yep, brilliant. Great. Okay, so this is my little slideshow. It won't be too long, I promise. And uh, perhaps, I don't know if you can still see my face on one of the cameras, but anyway, uh, I will. Uh, so this is the title of the talk The Wonderful World of Soapy Surfaces. That's me, Dr. Mark Walsh. Just call me Mark. Uh, and I'm a lecturer at Beneath University, as you can tell from this. So I'm going to ask a very simple question to begin with, uh, if I can get this thing to work. Yeah, this is my simple question. So let's think about bubbles. This is the motivational question for the talk. So you all know what a bubble is. And of course, you can make a bubble out of soapy water. Um, and the question is, why is a bubble round? So I don't know if that's a question you've ever thought about. It, it's one of those things that seems really obvious and simple until you actually start to try to answer the question. And then you begin to realize maybe there's a little bit more to this. So for example, why isn't a bubble square? Why isn't it sort of oval shaped or sausage shaped? Why, why does it form a round sphere? Okay, so that's the first question. Now I'm not going to try to answer that question just yet. And depending on your background and what kind of expertise you have, you might have different ways of answering this. So if you ask somebody in a chemistry lab the answer to this question, they might give you a different point of view to say a mathematician like me. So I'm going to answer this question from the point of view of a mathematician, and we're going to build up to an answer uh, which we will get to towards the end. But I'll let you think about that for now. Why do you think a bubble is round? So let's take another case. So 
This is a general soap film. And notice I use the word with boundary because unlike the bubble, I use some kind of wire kind of edging to make this particular soap, uh, soap film. You can see I have two circles and I've got a kind of a tube, a kind of a, a strange little tube connecting the two. And it's not a flat cylinder. Look, it kind of bends in in a, in a funny way. So this is, a, this is what I call a soap film with boundary. The boundary, the border of the soap film is the, is the wire that you use to make it. So obviously this isn't round. It sort of curves in some particularly funny way, but it's not a nice round sphere. It's a bit more complicated. Let me show you another even more complicated one. Hopefully this one is visible. So this has lots of pieces of boundary, lots of circles together that, that kind of uh, allow you to form quite a complicated soap film. And we're going to make some ourselves in a few minutes. So the more general question, besides why a bubble is round, is what causes the soap film to adopt a certain shape? Okay. Now that's actually quite a complicated question. And we're going to just touch on some of the reasons, some of the, the factors that go into this in this talk. But in general, it's actually quite a hard problem for mathematicians to predict if you have some piece of wire and you dip it into soapy water, what shape the soap film is going to form. It's quite, it's quite a difficult question. And so the partial answer I will give you from a mathematician's point of view is this involves two concepts. Um, one of these is, and I, I hopefully you can read the writing, I have it down here in bold. One of these is what we call surface area. Okay? In other words, how much space the, the soap film takes up. And the other is something called curvature, which is a little bit harder to understand, but we will, we will say a few words about it later. So those are the two kind of key words right now, surface area and curvature. And I'm going to give you in the next few minutes just a quick explanation of what these words mean. And that'll help you then understand what's going on when we actually go to start making our soapy surfaces. So let's start with area. So I'm going to start with something that should be fairly familiar to you. Okay, let's take a nice shape, a rectangle. Okay, and let's talk about area. So you all know what length means. And you see at the top of the, the screen here, I have one unit. Okay, the units could be centimeters. They could be meters, they could be kilometers, whatever you want, okay? We'll just think of one piece of length. And then what we can do is we can take a shape like a rectangle and you notice that this is broken up into kind of a vertical and a horizontal piece. I've got a sort of horizontal length on the bottom and I've got a vertical length. One of them I've done in blue, the other I've done in red. So if you want, you could call the horizontal one length and the vertical one height, if you prefer, it's fine. And what we do is we mark off, we count off units, okay? So we, we notice that in terms of the horizontal length, we have six units across. In terms of the vertical height, we have four units across. And this allows us to break up our rectangle into little square units, okay? So the, in other words, the square version of a, of a length unit, what we call an area unit, okay? And uh, if we count up the number of squares, you'll find we get exactly six times four, or in other words, 24 square units. And so this is what we regard as the area of the rectangle, okay? So you've seen this kind of thing. If you have centimeters, sometimes you see area measured in square centimeters or centimeters squared. That's, that's the idea of it, okay? So that's all we mean by measuring area of a nice shape like a rectangle. Now here's where things get a little bit more interesting. What if I don't have a nice region? What if I have a messy region, okay? Some kind of, you know, maybe, maybe this is a, a lake you found somewhere or, you know, somebody has marked off some kind of complicated shape that's not as nice as a rectangle. How do you measure the area of a region like this? And one way of doing it, which is going to seem maybe, you know, a little simplistic, but one way of doing this is to simply break it up into simple shapes like rectangles. So one of the ways mathematicians over the years have solved this problem is to take the messy region and use rectangles, things we know, to fill out the region. Now, I haven't finished doing it here. As you can see, I've kind of used a few rectangles and I've approximated as best I can the region. But the idea is the more time you have, and if you have a good computational device, a good machine, you could put in thousands, thousands and hundreds of thousands of rectangles, smaller and smaller rectangles, getting closer and closer to the shape you want. And you can get an answer which is as accurate as you like for the actual area of the shape, just by working out the areas of each of the rectangles and adding them together. Okay. So, sorry, I, I accidentally went ahead. So that's, that's, that's one way of doing this, approximate. Take a complicated shape, break it into simpler shapes. Now let's consider a slightly harder problem. So what you have to imagine now is all of these, all of these pictures are what we call two-dimensional pictures. You've got a, you know, a, a piece of paper, you maybe draw a region on a piece of paper. But of course, we live in three-dimensional space. And so what now if we picked up our, our rectangle, let's pretend it was made of rubber and we started to distort it and, and change it in space. So here's the idea. 
So you have your nice rectangle, but it's made of rubber or plastic or like a plastic bag, and you start to stretch it and distort it in space. Now things are a little bit harder. How do you measure the area of that shape that's distorted in space? Well, there's a problem, which is of course that the nice rectangles you had to use beforehand have been sort of warped and distorted in various ways. And so measuring the areas of these things is much harder. But mathematicians have developed ways of doing this. Now, this is not the time or the place to describe how mathematicians measure the area of complicated surfaces that have been distorted. I'll simply point out to you, and this is something you learn in more advanced mathematics classes. Um, there's a course, if, if any of you go out to do mathematics in university, and some of this, in fact, you will see in secondary school. There's a mathematical course called Calculus, in which you learn all about how to measure complicated shapes by using simple shapes like rectangles. Um, but there are ways of doing this. It's hard, but it can be done. Now, I have no intention of measuring anything today. I just want to point out to you that this idea of area isn't just for rectangles. It isn't just for nice uh, shapes on a sheet of paper. Actually, it's for surfaces in space. And there's one really important example of this that you all know. And I'm going to finish with this example. And this is, of course, measuring surface area on the Earth. Okay? Because, of course, the Earth is a big ball. And its surface is what mathematicians call a sphere, a round sphere. And uh, you can imagine, if you were to sort of deform a rectangle by stretching it and contorting it, you could cover, you could essentially gift wrap um, the, uh, the surface of the Earth, provided this rectangle was stretchy and, and rubbery. And you can see how the, the, uh, the little squares, the little units get distorted in the surface of the Earth. But there are ways of compensating for that, of measuring um, surface area. And in fact, just in case you're curious, um, the Earth's surface area is approximately, well, it's a little bit over 500 million square kilometers. I, I, I figured there are 510 million square kilometers. So um, that's an approximate figure. And I'm not counting, just for the purpose of this figure, I'm not counting things like hills and valleys and so on, which of course adds extra complication to this. I'm just thinking of this as a nice, perfect um, sphere. Okay. So that's all I mean by area, okay? And I just, the only concept I want you to, to remember is that area isn't just for flat things. Area can be measured for curved things that are curving around in space, okay? So if you, if you can understand that concept of measuring area for curved things, we're going to be able to apply this notion to the soapy surfaces that we're gonna make in a, in a couple of minutes. So as well as area or surface area, the other term I used was curvature, okay? And curvature is, a, is quite a complicated concept in mathematics. And there's only one aspect of this concept that I want to get across to you today. And, and if you can remember this, this will be all you'll need to know. So there are three types of curvature that we're going to care about for our surfaces. One is called positive curvature. The other is called zero or sometimes flat curvature. And the last is called negative curvature. And you can see diagrams with these kinds of curvature here. The kind of curvature that you see on the surface of the Earth is what we call positive curvature. The kind of curvature you see on a sheet of paper, even if you bend the sheet of paper as if you're folding it into a cylinder, um, that's what we call zero or flat curvature. And finally, the kind of curvature you see, you see on this last shape, which is a little bit like the saddle on a horse, this is what we call a negative curvature. And one of the things you can tell about curvature is what it does to triangles. If you look at the triangle on a sphere, you can see the triangle on the top picture is bulging. It's a fat triangle, it's bulging outwards. If you look at the triangle on the bottom, it's a thin triangle, it's kind of squashed inwards. And of course, the triangle on the flat sheet of paper is a regular triangle, like the kind of triangle we used. So you can understand curvature by what it does to triangles. Okay, that's all I care about with regard to curvature. We'll mention these words again, surface area and curvature in a few minutes. But at this point, I'm going to switch now back to the camera on me, if I can figure out which camera I'm supposed to be using. And I'm going to show you some interesting surfaces that we're going to make. Mark, can I interrupt you for a second? I, yes. have, I have a question from fifth class, Akian Shannon. Does the yeah. shape of the bottle affect the shape of your bubble? Does the shape of what, sorry? The... Does the shape of the bottle affect the shape of your bubble? Um, by bottle, I assume they mean the thing I'm using to make the bubble. And the answer is yes, it will. The shape, the shape will, the, you're, you're going to see now in a minute when I put in, I'm going to put in pieces of wire that are in loops and I'm going to make uh, um, uh, so soapy surfaces, we'll call, um, from this. And that's going to affect the shape um, greatly. Now, if you're talking about an actual bubble, an actual, you know, regular round bubble, 
And the answer is that the bottle, the bubble came out of, won't make any difference because the bubble, when it, once it's removed from the bottle, it will forget where it came from and will, it will automatically become round. And there's a reason why it always becomes round, which I'm going to get to. So if the question is about an actual regular bubble coming out of it, coming out of it, you know, when you blow through a little, a little, um, a little sort of circular little hoop, even if the circle was changed to a square or a triangle, it wouldn't make any difference in the end. The bubble would eventually become round. And there's a reason for that. So I'll get to that. I'll get to that shortly. Perfect. Thanks. And um, a, a question in from Fiona. Fiona A. Yates in Cunial. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. National School. Apologies. I missed that question. So don't worry. There is a recording of this and I will send you a link once we have finished. It'll be later today. So apologies. I, I, I don't know what the question is relating to, but I will send you a, a, a recording of this presentation. Thanks. Yeah, and people can always email me questions afterwards. I'm happy to try and answer it. So. And I'll, I'll send you on my email address before we're done. Okay, so um, hopefully hopefully all of that was clear. People could understand what I'm saying. And as I said, I'm, I'm happy to have questions. You can just send them in the chat and Isa will relay them to me. So I'm now going to turn off my screen share. Uh, and uh, hopefully, I, I, this is the problem with having two cameras. Uh, that was, no, you're, was you're appearing down in the bottom right corner. Um, I'm down in the bottom right corner, so you can see yeah. my ear, I think. Okay, so I'm gonna stand yeah. up over here. Perfect, yeah. Um, so am I visible now? Yeah. You are. Okay, I'm visible now. So what I'm going to do, I have a great big tub of, uh, so hang on, if I wave my hand here, yes, you can see me. Um, I'm going to dip, I have, a, I have a, 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 I made this from a coat hanger, okay, so this is just a piece of a coat hanger, and I have a big tub of soapy water here. Now, I don't know if you can see my soapy water, so maybe, uh, maybe I'll tilt the camera a little bit for a second. Now, I, I'm afraid to do this because the camera is in such a nice spot, but let me, let me tilt it down for a second. And you can see I have a big tub here of soapy water. Is that is that visible? Yeah, we can see the soapy you water. Yeah. Okay. Now I have to see if I can get the camera back nicely. I'm, I'm. This is a top quality equipment here. I'm using an iPad perched up on a stack of binders, but uh, uh, maybe I shouldn't have messed with that. Okay. I think about there. Is... Up a wee bit. Yep. Dead on. Dead on. Yep. Okay. All right. So I have a coat hanger that I've kind of contorted a little bit. And I'm just going to dip the coat hanger into my into my soapy water, okay? And hopefully you can see there's a if I shake it a bit, can can people see the bubble that or at least the soapy surface that I make? Yep. Now what I want you to notice is now I I kind of messed with the coat hanger a bit too much, and if any of you have ever tried to sort of put a coat hanger back into the shape it was in after you've contorted, you'll find it's very difficult. But let's pretend for a second the coat hanger is roughly in its original shape, and you can see that if you look at it this way, hopefully you can see this. The surface I get is basically flat. Okay. Now, if I shake it around a bit, notice it gets bigger, right? It sort of wobbles, and the area is getting larger. As I shake it around, I get larger and larger area. This is me shaking my hand. But if you let it settle by trying to hold my hand steady, oh, it's burst. I'll get another one. Hang on. Eventually, of course, the, the, the surface dies. If you hold it steady, eventually um, it'll sort of reach a kind of a favorite shape, a favorite configuration, which in this case is roughly flat. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do now is, I'll just shake that a bit. I'm going to contort this a bit more, make it a bit messier. And I'm going to dip this in again. And now you see the shape is a bit more complicated. I'm going to come up a bit closer to the screen here, hopefully now, is that maybe that's clearer. So you can see this shape. It looks a little bit like, do you remember the saddle shape, the negative curvature shape I had on the last slide? It looks a little bit like that, okay? You can imagine if you try to draw triangles on this surface, it would be very difficult. Um, you, you would, you, they would become skinny triangles, okay? So this is my, this is, hopefully this is clear. I, 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 the, the trouble with this is I have no interaction, so I can't tell, but Isa, you can, you can yeah. tell me if this is visible. Um, you can see this kind of saddle shape, it would burst, eventually it bursts, but uh, if you have enough uh, washing up liquid, it kind of it can last for a while. But you can see this nice kind of um, uh, saddle shape, okay? And so I want you to just start thinking about, you know, if you shake it around, you get this kind of big bulging thing. You get things eventually that look kind of like a round sphere, at least in parts. But once you let it settle, I'm going to stop shaking it now, it sort of always goes back to the same, roughly the same kind of saddle shape. Okay. It sort of, it has a, it has, it seems to have a favorite shape it wants to get into. Okay. So think about that. Why, why you think that is the favorite shape? Okay. Compared to all these other ones. Why, for example, it doesn't blow up in a big, Kind of round ball up here, for example. Why doesn't it do that? Why does it always seem to go back to this favorite, this favorite shape? All right. Okay. So that's that's a that's a first sort of thing to think about. Now, this just to look at my 
examine my coat hanger again for a second. My coat hanger, you can think of, I have a bit where I'm holding, but if you ignore that, it's, it's what we call a closed loop, is that hopefully the coat hanger is, I don't know if it's even, is it visible? Yeah, it's, it's one closed loop, okay? It doesn't have lots of bits crisscrossing, okay? Let's take a slightly more complicated shape. Now, you remember my platonic solids at the start? So I built for you a tetrahedron. This is a nicer looking tetrahedron than the one I showed you, but it's the yellow one. I probably should have started with this one. So this is a tetrahedron. It's made out of four uh, triangles. Each triangle is the same shape. They're all equilateral triangles. And uh, it's four of glued together. Yeah, I was just about to ask you that. So teachers and pupils in their own school, like you made this yourself. So this is something the teachers- Yeah, I'm, I'm not particularly talented, but I made this myself using straws and glue. Now, for very sound ecological reasons, you cannot buy plastic straws anymore. So I had to buy kind of permanent ones, not the disposed permanent plastic straws. And I bought myself a hot glue gun and I just glued these together. So it's a bit crude, but for the purposes I'm going to use it for, it'll do the job. Okay. Yeah. So if you're if you're interested in how to make these things, I'll, I, I can I can I can give you some information later. So this is my tetrahedron. So notice now it isn't just one simple coil. There's actually four kind of coils. Each coil is like a triangle glued together. And so the question is, well, if you imagine dipping one of these sides of the triangle, if I just dip one of them in, hopefully you can see this, I just have a flat piece of uh, surface, of soap surface at one end, okay? Exactly what you'd expect, okay? Now, if I shake it around a bit, it kind of bulges, it gets rounder, but eventually it settles back to the flat. That's fine. The question is though, what happens if I dip the entire thing in, okay? So I'll let you think about that for a second. What do you think you might get? Well, if you asked me before I ever did this, probably I, I wouldn't think about it too much. And I'd just say, well, you're gonna get four flat triangles, right? Four flat triangular pieces of surface, exactly as you got on the one face. Why would it be any different? Want me to dip it in? Go on, I, I'm, I'm very curious we'll here, yeah, Let's yeah. See what we get. So I'm dipping the entire thing in, which unfortunately my camera doesn't let you see it dipped in, but you'll see the thing that comes out. And hopefully it's clear what I have here. Oh, wow. You don't actually get um, four separate flat triangles. What you get is all of the surfaces close into the center and there's a nice sort of center point here. Hopefully that center point is clear. Okay, so they're all bulging into a kind of a point in the center. Okay, so, so you actually get um, uh, a quite, quite a more complicated shape than, um, than maybe you would have expected. And in fact, one of the things I can do if I dip it in a second time, just at the bottom, hang on a second, I have to do this rather carefully. And now you see, I get a bubble in the middle, which is not round. Hopefully you can see the bubble in the middle, it's kind of distorted. It's, 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 the, the bubble in the middle is, is a little tetrahedron and so it just bursts, so I'll do it again. Um, but the bubble in the center is like a little tetrahedron, slightly warped. Um, but it's like a little tetrahedron in its own right. There it is. So you can see this kind of bubble in the center. Again, I I hope this is coming through on the camera. It's always very hard to know. This, this is this is yeah. No, we can see that. And better Mark, to see it live. Yeah, and can we can we explain why that shape appears? Well, well, I'm going to give you explanation well, soon, but I want you yeah. to think about this a little bit as to why it forms that particular shape. I, I'm sitting here thinking. I'm, I'm supposed to be your assistant, but I'm I'm intrigued. Yeah, so, so they're, they're, hopefully uh, if I'm spinning it around enough times, you can see. So that's trapping a bubble in the center. And notice this particular bubble is not round. Now, of course, this isn't, we're sort of cheating here, right? Because this isn't a round bubble floating around in space on its own, right? This bubble has pressure on it because it's being kind of contorted and pulled by the rest of the soap film, okay? So the rest of the soap film is contorting and pulling this thing in a certain way. So again, I want you to think about that. And if I shake it around a bit, you see it sort of bulges, but, What's important here is there's a certain amount of air trapped inside of this. And that volume of air isn't changing, okay? What's changing is the shape around it that's, that's enclosing that volume of air. So that's kind of a hint, it just, it just bursts there. Again, these things have limit, limited lifespan, but, um, oh, hang on, I'll, I'll do one more time just so it's clear, because I have a, another shape to do. Oh, what happens is once you do this a few times, you start to generate subs in the, in the thing and they get in the way. So. Yeah, and we have a question from a teacher. What's the ideal mix of your soap mix? Um, so the uh, approximately, so I have at the top here is about 50 litres. And you, you want roughly one litre of washing up liquid for about every 15 litres of water. So 
about three liters of washing up liquid in my tub that has about, I put in about 45 liters of water and about three liters of washing up liquid. That was, now that may not be the best one, but it worked pretty well here. Um, okay, so that's, that's the tetrahedron. We can do it again if people want to see it, if people didn't quite get a good look at it. Okay, but I'm gonna try another one now. Uh, so the next shape I'm going to bring up um, is, uh, so this is a square-based pyramid. This is actually not one of the platonic solids I mentioned earlier, because notice the shape that the faces are not all the same. You have four triangles, excuse me, along the top, and then you have a square base uh, at the bottom here. So it's a slightly, it's a slight variation, but let's just try it out, okay? Um, so I'm gonna put it in. And uh, because I used hollow straws and I tried to glue the end so that they were sealed, but every now and then there's a little hole and the water gets in and bubbles come out. So that just complicates things for a little bit. Hopefully you can see now uh, what's happening. Um, you have uh, a kind of a little archway at the very top. I don't know if that's clear. Uh, a funny little kind of a, a flat piece at the top. Looks like a kind of a, a you know, a, a, a sort of a Gothic cathedral or something, the kind of the shape of the arch. Uh, and uh, maybe the sunlight is making it hard to see. Hopefully that's clear. But you get a sort of a mini pyramid underneath coming up and then you get this funny little kind of cusp at the top, um, closing off to the top. So it's, it's, again, it's, I mean, I don't know about you, I would not have predicted that shape in advance of dipping the thing in. So, so uh, let's try dipping it a second time just to see if we can capture a little bubble inside. I've, uh, I'll have to do it twice now because I lost the, uh, okay, so that's the regular pyramid. And uh, I'll try and capture a bubble inside. Okay, almost. Yeah. Okay, there we go. So now you can see a kind of a, it's what, what we call a trapezoid, a trapezoidal shape inside of this thing. Hopefully you can, hopefully you can see that. It's not clear to me it's coming out well with the lights, but uh, anyway. Okay, let me move on to the next shape, which is another one of these platonic solids. And uh, this is our old friend, the octahedron. So the octahedron is made using triangles, and we have eight of them, as the, 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 the title suggests, octahedron. So four of them making the top of one of those pyramids, uh, and four of them making the bottom. When you glue them together, you no longer have a, a square face, you just have triangular faces. So it's, it's, a, it's a proper platonic solid, all of the faces are the same. And I'm gonna try dipping this thing in and we'll see what we get. Now this one I quite like because it, what comes up inside reminds me a little bit of a collection of diamonds. Well, do it again now. Hopefully, it's clear. Yeah. So now you see, hopefully, inside the uh, sparkly pieces, and you have um, it looks like a pentagon, but it's kind of slightly warped um, inside. Okay. But it isn't just as you might have, as at least as some people might naively have thought, just you know eight separate flat triangles. Again, it closes in towards the center, and you can see I have a kind of a bubble trapped in the middle here. Um, and no matter how many times you do that, Mark, it always comes out. It will always come out roughly the same kind of thing. Yeah, now I have a bubble trapped in the middle. Let me try again to see if I can avoid that bubble trapped. Uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I wanted now. So, so if people can see, I don't know if people can see the little sort of pentagon in the center there. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll turn it this way. Hopefully you can see the little pentagon in the middle. So there's this pentagon, it's, it's warping around. It's not a perfect regular pentagon. It's, some of the edges are a bit longer than others, but it's, it's hopefully the pentagon is visible trapped in the center. Yeah, and you've mentioned a lot of shapes there, Mark. Do mathematicians come up with new shapes every day, every year? Oh, or... yeah, a lot, of, a lot of what mathematicians do is classifying shapes. So it, it's a little bit like biologists finding animals in the wild and you know working out different kinds of species. Mathematicians do that with shapes. Now, we don't just deal with these nice, simple shapes. We deal with shapes in higher dimensions. So if you know about dimensions, which uh, will be the subject of an interesting talk in its own right, 
Um, my work deals with shapes in seven dimensions. I, I study what are called seven dimensional spheres. So that's a very interesting uh, type of shape in its own right. And that's maybe a talk for another day. Okay, this thing is, 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 is finally evaporating, but hopefully you've got to see the little Pentagon in the middle. Maybe I'll just show it one last time because I really like the Pentagon here. Uh, I'm entertaining myself now. Uh, it's coming, come on. Let's go and I'll get to my favorite example in a moment. Anyway, there's the, you can oh, see it again. Yeah. Okay. When did so, you, when did your research start and with the bubbles, Mark? Uh, no, this wouldn't be, I mean, I, I have to say, I like the bubbles because I shapes and there is a connection I'm interested in this notion of curvature that we talked about earlier that i yeah. mentioned remember i mentioned that the saddle shape curvature and the, the positive curvature on the sphere so a lot of my research involves classifying shapes according to the different kinds of curvature they have yeah. and this has a lot of applications in physics so i don't know if any of you know what a black hole is or you study things like um you know interested in questions like what shape is the universe yeah so those kinds of questions um, in order to answer these questions, the physicists working on this stuff, they need geometry. They need to be able to understand quite complicated shapes. So the kind of mathematics I do is essentially the language, the geometric language that many of these physicists use when they're studying, when they're answering questions like what shape is the universe or how does space get warped near a black hole, those kinds of interesting questions. I'm not a physicist, I should say. But the kind of mathematics I do is the language that many of these physicists. Well, use. and it's back to what we were saying at the start. You know, maths is so important for every aspect of um, science, physics, chemistry, biology, engineering. So, yeah, I mean, one of one of the things that the thing about maths is I like maths for, you know, reasons about how pretty it is, and uh, you know, because I like I like shapes, I like I like art. So when I do maths, I'm not doing it because I particularly find it practical. I just find it enjoyable. Some mathematics is motivated by a practical need. There's a practical problem that we need to solve and uh, we need maths to do it. So much of mathematics is developed to solve practical problems. But there's another side to this. There's a lot of mathematics that has been developed purely because people were curious and interesting. And I think that's the best reason in the world to study a subject is because you find it interesting and fun. And what is often the case is that many times mathematics that was done hundreds of years ago purely because it was fun, was found later to be very, very useful. It was found later to be the basis of something very, very important. So it's worth studying math, even if you don't have immediate practical reason, because the track record historically is so good that mathematics almost always ends up being useful later on, even if it's not useful straight away. So it's worth remembering that if you, if you just enjoy mathematics. Now, the cube, this is my favorite example. Because dipping the cube in, again, if you just dip in one face, right, let's say at the bottom of here, oh, I managed to burst it immediately. I'm having a tough time getting this to just give me one, one face. There we go. So if you just dip in one face, it's exactly what you'd expect. It's a flat square. Okay. And I can shake it around a bit. See, I get this kind of, it gets, look, the surface area gets bigger when I shake it around, look bigger and bigger, big. A big ball, but if I let it, if I hold it still for a bit, it gradually comes to rest, okay? And it's stable, it's, it's back to its, its favorite shape. Its favorite shape is just a flat square. And just to give you a little hint about the bubble question and these other questions, notice that when I shake it around, notice the area gets bigger. It's taking up way more space. Look, it's, it's becoming huge. And then when I let it settle, the area that it takes up seems to get smaller, okay? So there seems to be a preference in nature for keeping the area, the surface area of the surface as small as it possibly can be, okay? That's a very important hint in, in answering our bubble question, okay? It's about keeping the area as small as possible. It's more stable, it's happier when the area is small. Okay, so that's fine. So that's just one face, right? And again, a little bit like the tetrahedron, but at this point you probably have learned from experience. It's, it, it might be tempting to think, if I dip the entire cube in, I just get a bunch of flat. You know, how many, how many faces does a cube have? Six, right? So if I dip this cube in, it's tempting to think I'll just get six flat squares. But you know better now, because we did this with the tetrahedron. Remember the tetrahedron here had four triangular faces. 
And when we dipped it in, we didn't just get four flat triangles. We found this, this kind of tendency for the soap film to converge into the center. There was a kind of a, a, a cluster point at the center where all the faces seemed to be. And something similar is gonna happen in the cube. And it's, in, in my opinion, it's quite surprising. So let me dip in the cube. I'll hold it for a second, count to three, say the magic words. Hopefully now it'll, it'll come out okay. So it'll give it give it a second now to come to, to rest. It's a bit. Hold on a second, I need to. There we go. Now it's it's coming to rest. There we go. So notice that it comes to a center point, but it's even better than that. I told it this way. Notice the center point is a square. It's not actually a single point. It actually forms a little square in the middle. Hopefully that's clear. Yeah. Which I find really surprising. And, you know, I'm a professional mathematician. I've been doing mathematics for many years. But before I first did this, if you had asked me what shape it was going to make, I would not have predicted this. I'm not that smart that I would have known this is what was going to happen. I think it's quite hard to predict. Let me do it again because it, it just burst on me. I think it's, 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 it's not an easy thing to predict what nature finds the best shape for the soap film. So it's, it, give it a second now, it's, it's coming. Yeah, it takes, it takes a few seconds to find the best shape. Uh, so hopefully that's clear. I'll come right up to the camera. Um, so again, hopefully people can see the little square at the center. Uh, maybe, maybe it's a rectangle, I can't quite tell. I'm, I'm shaking it a bit. But, but to me, this is not at all what you'd expect to happen. Um, but this happens to be um, nature's favorite um, position or favorite configuration for this particular soap film. Now, I'm going to do it again, but this time I'm going to try and trap the bubble in the center. Because I said to you earlier that uh, bubbles are round, not square. But of course, that, that's, a bubble, that's a bubble floating around in space. But when you start cheating and distorting the bubble by having soap films around it, pulling it in different directions, you can actually make interesting things happen. So again, I'll, I'll just give this a second to find its natural shape. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm better do it again, sorry. There we go. So I have it here now. I've got it, the, the square is pointed downwards. So that's why you don't quite see it yet. But I'm going to just try and catch a little bit of air underneath it. And now we have what is for all intents and purposes a square bubble trapped in the middle. Hopefully that's clear. I'm, I'm moving it around so that it can be captured. I think I might have lost this. There we go. I think I have it back. So hopefully you can see it looks like a very old television set. Um, oh, burst it. The problem with moving it around for the camera is I make it less stable. Let me try that again. Ita, was that visible? Yes, it was. Yep. All right, let me try again. Okay, so this is my, my original one with the little square in the center. And I'm gonna try, hopefully you can see what I'm doing. I'm turning the square so the square is flat toward the top of the tub. And then I'm trying to capture a little bit of air underneath. Not too much air, there we go. So hopefully that's clear. So that's a, there's a square bubble inside of that. Now, as I said, I'm not claiming that bubbles are square. This is this bubble, it, it, we're cheating here. This bubble is being kind of influenced by the rest of the frame. So it's being pulled in various directions. So it sort of looks like it's square, but it's, it's, it's not a bubble floating in space. So, okay, it's eventually, it's eventually falling out of, out of configuration. So I'll stop for a second. So if we, if we um, get back to our original question for a second, and uh, maybe I can see if I can actually make a round bubble here. I didn't, I didn't bring, I should have brought a, uh, one of those little blow things and I didn't even think about it. I was so busy. By the way, here's another saddle. I like this. This looks like a tent that's kind of collapsed, right? Um, but let's let me blow through. Oh, it, 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 it existed for a second, but it didn't last. Let's try again. There. Oh. It floated towards you, I hope. Yeah, it did. There's another one. I'm trying to sort of blow bubbles, blow bubbles at you. No, 
Well, you got one. Yeah, it's floating towards my iPad. I probably I'm probably going to destroy my iPad here. But it, it'll be worth it. Okay, you get the idea. You all know what a round bubble looks like. So the question then is, well, why is the bubble round? Okay. Now I hinted at this earlier when I said to you all that the um, the area is what matters here. What nature is trying to do in order to make the soap film survive as long as possible to make it stable, it wants as little as possible of the soap film to be exposed to the air because the currents in the air are causing the evaporation of the water and they're causing the bubble to break up, they're causing the soap film to break up. This is why eventually it bursts, it doesn't last forever. Now you can, you can delay that by adding in soap, that causes the water to sort of cling together in a better way. And there's lots of interesting science and chemistry behind, you know, which kind of soap works best and how best to, to, to make the, make the, the, the surface as stable as possible. But from a geometric or mathematical point of view, what matters is the area. How much exposure is there? How much of the area is exposed um, to the currents in the air? And so what nature favors is the minimum, the smallest possible surface area. Now, if you imagine your bubble, you blow a bubble, okay? It doesn't matter what shape the little bottle cap is, if the shape the bottle cap is round or square, you can try it out, you can use any shape you want. Ultimately, the bubble, it might wibble and wobble for a second, but eventually it settles as a round sphere for as long as it lasts. It might burst very quickly afterwards, but it settles as a round sphere. Mark, can the, I can, there have a couple of questions? Yeah. Could I ask them or do you want to wait to the end? Yeah, I'll, I'll just give you, give me a 10 yeah, second yeah. to finish. I'm just about to get to the punchline. Then I'll oh, sorry. The so, so eventually the bubble settles um, as a round sphere. And the reason for that, and this is a, this is a, a mathematical fact that you will learn about um, when you're a little bit older, but I'll tell you now, is that in order to capture that volume of air, the smallest possible surface that captures a certain volume of air is the round sphere. Anything else is going to have more area. You make it square, there'll be a bigger area. You make it oblong, there'll be a larger area. The perfect, the most perfect minimal amount of surface area and minimal exposure to the atmosphere is given by the round sphere. And so that's why whenever you blow a bubble, it always ends up going into its simplest, safest possible configuration, which is the round sphere. Now, when we dip in uh, these, 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 uh, these shapes, like a tetrahedron, for example, I'll go back to the tetrahedron again, you see our old friend the tetrahedron. What the soap film is doing is going to the shape that gives it the minimum possible area. And so by closing into the center like this, okay, rather than having four flat triangles, this, this one of closing into the center has smaller area, smaller exposure than if all of the outside is covered in triangles, okay? That's, that's the reason. And so nature automatically moves you into the soap film shape that has the minimal possible area. And so when you, in advance try to predict if i say if i take for example my cube let's do the cube again and i'm sorry i know i have questions to answer i promise i'll answer those in a second if i take my cube again here and i think about i want to create a surface with the smallest area but there's a constraint there's a special condition on this which is that the surface it can't just float around like a round round sphere in space it has to be connected to all of the edges so you have to design a piece of surface which connects all the edges. How many edges? There are 12 edges, if you count them. There are 12 edges on a cube. It has to connect all 12 edges in a continuous surface and yet have the smallest possible area. Well, having six flat squares isn't the one that has the smallest area. There are better options. And so what nature does is it moves you. It moves the whole surface into the best possible option. And the really amazing thing is, and this is my last point, and then I promise I'll answer every question you have, the really amazing thing is to me is that if you if you give me this configuration in advance, okay, like a cube, or even like my my coat hanger in some in some strange coil, okay. Hopefully there might my coat hanger there. Clear. Here, I'll, I'll dip it in just to just to kind of uh, make it. There's my my coat hanger example, right? You can see the, the floating, okay. And if I was to plot in the coordinates on a computer of all of the edge, the, what we call the boundary of the coat hanger. And ask the computer to predict in advance what the best possible surface would be with the smallest possible area. The computer would really struggle 
In fact, even with a very powerful computer, it might take you hours and hours and hours or days of calculation for the computer to come up with a good approximation. That's how hard the problem is. And yet nature does it immediately. When you, when you, when you dip it into soapy water, it naturally just goes to the answer, to the answer to this hard maths problem. So that's something I find very interesting. And I'll finish just by dipping in the cube again, because this is my favorite one, and then I'll take questions. Um, if we dip the cube back in, uh, is it going to go to its, come on, there we go. Sometimes you have to shake it a bit to prompt it, but you can see the little square. And again, that's one that I have to admit, I never would have predicted, okay? But that's, 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 that's the, that is the minimal possible, that's the surface with the minimal possible area that connects all of the 12 edges of the cube, okay? And why it looks like that is a fascinating question. Um, but that happens to be the answer. So, so you could have tried for a long time on your computer to answer this, but nature does it almost immediately. Yeah, that's okay. interesting, Mark, because actually uh, Scully Growney, hi, hi, Winter, dear my dog is wrong. They actually asked a question. What, see that shape that you had there, Mark? Can you, yeah. can you put your finger through the square in the middle or what happens? Yeah. Let's try and do that. That's a very good yeah. see, This is this is why um, children make the best scientists because they like to do funny things like that and to see what happens. So if I put my finger in, look, makes no difference. The the well now it does. <laughs> Eventually it does, but initially initially it is a uh, it just it, it the surface just formed around it. But uh, let's see. How, let's try it again. Let's see how long it lasts. Um, Okay, so there's the square. Oh, hang on, I lost it. There's the square in the middle. Let's put my finger in and see if it changes things. Yeah, so see what happens when I put my finger in. Initially, it didn't do anything, but then eventually the whole thing closed in on my finger. So now I have, oh, it died. But you're, yeah, it does make, so I take it back. It does make a difference. It took a second for it to, to, to make a difference, but it does make a difference. It's, it's like adding in an extra edge to the square, you know? Um, and so, yeah, it, 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 it does make a difference. So great question, Scully Granny. And yeah, that was an excellent. That was an excellent question. I mean, yeah. yeah, you want to experiment by adding extra features, extra edges, and see what happens. So I, I don't. So just following on from Scully Granny's uh, question, Skull Emer, fourth class, has asked, "What happens when you blow into that cube, um, Mark?" Well, I, 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 I'm going to try and make. I, I, I don't know, but I think maybe I'll make a little bubble inside if I can. Let's have a go. Oh wow! Yeah, so I blew a bubble through it, and now I just have a hollow corridor. So I have, I have the there's a gap at the front and a gap at the back, and the other the edges these other edges are covered. So so I can put my hand right through, makes no difference. But the other and it's 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 not quite flat; it still curves in a bit, but it's it's definitely closer to the the, the flat configuration that you expect. I've lost this edge here now, so I've got I've just got these guys. So you can see, um, I have. Three faces have films on them and three faces are empty. Um, let's try that again though. That was a really good idea. I like that idea of blowing through. So you're getting me to do things I never bothered doing. We have budding mathematicians from all over the country. All right, I'm gonna blow through again. Yeah, and it just, it blow, essentially blows a hole through the middle and then you get a corridor. I can put my head right through. Well, I, my head's a bit big, but almost goes right through. Yeah, great question. Excellent question. Yeah, and that was the same question from Ms. Lennon in fourth class in Scully Manshrock. Then we have another question. Um, question from fourth class in Nurney. Um, how many shapes are there in total? I love that question. Many shapes all together. Well, that's a brilliant question. Yeah, and, it's yeah, a the thing, the thing about that question, I would love to know the answer. I don't know the answer to that. Part you of the thing is you have to sort of decide what you mean by shapes. So, for example, if you like really nice shapes, like these platonic solids. So if you remember, let's let's get out one of these. Let's get out. Let's get out the uh, the dodecahedron. Oh, I actually got a bit of soap on it. Um, uh, if you take the dodecahedron, okay. So notice that each face is a pentagon. If you look at the faces, I, hopefully it's clear here. Each face is a pentagon. Five sides may not be. Yeah, they, that, I think that's a better angle there if you can see it. Um, if you look at, by the way, any of you play football, with, at least in the old days, footballs used to be made with patches. Some of them were pentagons and some of them were hexagons. And uh, uh, that was not quite as nice as this, but it, you, know, you, you could sort of see these, some of these shapes in action. But in this particular case, I have 12 of these pentagons glued together. Now, what's particularly nice about this shape is at every corner, you can see every corner looks the same. You have each corner, you have three edges meeting at the corner. 
Okay, and every single quarter looks the same. So there's a symmetry here. Every bit of this shape looks the same. Now, if you interest, if, if by shapes you mean nice symmetric shapes that all look the same at every point, okay, and that you build them out of these nice faces, these, these, these faces, by the way, are called polygons, okay, polygons. So a pentagon is a, is a five sided polygon one, two, three, four, five sides. Now, if you want to build your shapes out of nice, simple pieces, pieces that are polygons, and you want that at every point, at every corner, the shape looks exactly the same. You're asking a lot, right? That, that, that's putting a lot of pressure on the shape to, to be nice. And if you ask that question, then there are only five shapes. And they are the five I showed you. There's the, the dodecahedron, the icosahedron. This has 20 triangles. That's the icosahedron. It's a, maybe, I, I'm, I'm sorry if my, there, hopefully that's clear. It's not easy to, to show this on the camera. These are two of them, the dodecahedron, the icosahedron, and the others are the quite familiar ones. The tetrahedron, um, our old friend, the cube, which leads to very nice soap films. And uh, finally, the octahedron, where's my octahedron? Here it is, the octahedron, which is this guy. Octa for eight, okay, eight, eight triangle phase. And so if the condition is that the shape looks the same at every point and it's built out of these nice polygons, then that's the answer, fine, for those very nice shapes. But of course, there are lots of other kinds of shapes. I mean, this doesn't consider, for example, just an ordinary square-based pyramid like this one, okay? So this is not one of those nice ones because there's, a, there's an exception. There's a square at one end and then there's triangles everywhere else. So this is not quite as regular. It's not quite as nice as those other shapes, but it's still pretty nice, right? So if you expand the world to allow shapes that aren't quite as nice as these ones, you get lots more than five. And then of course, these all, all of these shapes have corners, right? So you might ask, well, what about nice smooth shapes like a round ball? That's a perfectly nice shape, a round sphere. And so, and then another shape, which I, I'm gonna draw on the board here because I haven't drawn the board yet. Um, if you take a donut, right, or a bagel, okay? Can you see that? Is my bagel clear? Can you see that, Ija? Yes, yep, yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, so, sorry, I'm busy looking at the questions, sorry. So that's, that's a nice shape. This is known as a torus. Okay, that's a torus. And so that's a perfectly nice shape, but it's not, it doesn't have any corners in it. So there are lots and lots of shapes. The answer is probably infinitely many. It depends upon what you mean by shape or how, how nice you want the shape to be or what your definition of nice is. Okay, so I hope I've answered that question. I, I'm laughing. I'm sorry I got distracted because, Mark, these are coming in fast and furious and they're very, very challenging. I think all the schools around the country are up in the ante here. So um, there's a, pub, a couple of um, questions and I love this one from Oshin and Cross Patrick. And it's a challenge and it's from Henry Martin. Um, so he's challenging, you know. <laughs> so can you, okay, put, go ahead. can you put your hand through the cube without bursting the bubble? And that's from Oshin. Uh, probably not, but I'll try. I, I always like a challenge, so I'll do my best. Yeah. Thank you, Washim. That's a, that's, a, that's a great challenge. I'll do my best. So uh, let's first of all try and make this thing. Come on. Okay, so here we go. Right, so now I have to try and put my hand through that bursting. I think that's going to be very difficult. Uh, you know, maybe I'll try, rather than going through the little square, I'll try, oh, I'll try going through here. No, no. No, it's, it's, it's not possible. At least it's not possible for me to do it. Maybe it's possible for somebody more, more clever. Um, but I think, I think maybe if you had a very thin piece of wire, you did it very, very slowly, uh, possibly. Let me actually, let me try with the coat hanger. Let's see what the coat hanger can do. If I put the coat hanger in, no, first it straight away. Sorry, Oshin, I couldn't, I couldn't meet your challenge. It was too hard. But, uh, we, we'll get practice on that on that one for Oshin and, and we may yeah. when, when maybe we maybe some other time some other time um we're it's, it's close to it's just after 11 o'clock mark and I think probably classes have other um maybe break to go to or anything like that um I will answer any of the questions that come in please uh, note that we will send a recording of this to all those who have registered mark on behalf of 
everyone that I work with, I'm delighted that you put on this show for our schools and thank you so much for your time. Thank you to the teachers for affording your class and um, to allow us to enter your classroom virtually today. And we're delighted with so many schools from all over the country. And I'm going to hand over Mark to you for the final words. Yeah, well, thank you very much. It was a real pleasure. I, it, it's always difficult in these uh, situations to have any idea uh, how what you're saying is being perceived because I cannot see the audience. So normally when I give lectures at the university, I have students in front of me and I can tell. But uh, um, I hope uh, that I was visible and audible and everything was understandable. Um, I think uh, I would just say to, to students that the most important reason for studying anything is because it's interesting. OK, and you should be motivated by that, by curiosity, ask questions and never let anybody sort of put you off asking a question. And the questions you asked today were brilliant questions. Ask any question you like. OK, don't be afraid to try things out. That's how we make discoveries in science, by asking even what people think of as silly questions, by asking them, trying things out. Don't ever be afraid to do that. Let your imaginations run wild. OK, all right. That's brilliant Thank advice. You. Yes, Mark. And I really love what you started off. The love of art brought you to maths. So I know one person in the attendees is loves her art. So hopefully this will drive her on to love maths even more. Love, loved your energy, loved your enthusiasm. All the teachers have my email address. If you need me to follow up on anything, please feel free to drop me. Yeah, I'm happy email. to take questions or talk more if anybody wants to, yeah. to, to contact me. Um, you can you can feel free to pass on my email address. That's fine. Look, and thanks, thanks so much. I think I'm going off to boil the kettle, have a nice cup of tea. Teachers, you go off and have a nice cup of tea or coffee. And um, pupils, hopefully you get a few minutes break too. And thank you so much for everyone. Thanks, Mark. No problem. Bye bye.